the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good evening. My name is Father Michael Marcantoni. I'm a priest of the Greek Orthodox Metropolis of Detroit. I want to thank you for tuning in and checking out this video as well as all of our other content. And I want to talk to you about something tonight that takes up well over half of the year. If you spend 50% of your year on something, I think it's a pretty safe bet to say that you consider it to be important. Now, if you count up over half of the over half of the days on the Orthodox calendar, they all have one thing in common. Fasting. There is some kind of fast on at least six months worth of the days of the year. And of course, in the Orthodox Church, that's not six months straight, right? That is nearly every Wednesday and Friday. That is the 40 days of Lent, uh, plus the week of Holy Week. Uh, the first 15 days of August, the 40 days leading up to Christmas, a variable length feast at the end, at the middle to the end of June, and a few other smaller uh, fast scattered throughout the calendar. And what that all equals up to is over 180 days where we're fasting. So when that's the case throughout the year, when that's such a staple, naturally, you're not going full on cold turkey, bread and water, or even water and air kind of fast. For the Orthodox Christian, presuming someone is physically healthy enough to do it, a strict fast would include would it would consist of uh, abstaining from no meat, no cheese, no dairy, no eggs, no wine, no olive oil, no fish with bones. Uh, mollusks and shellfish like octopus are always good, are always fast friendly. Uh, then of course you reduce the portion size and reduce the number of meals as well. And the money that you're not spending on those rich foods is supposed to go to charity. And that clues us into what the real nature of fasting is. Now, it bears mind saying, especially if this is a new, con a new concept to you. It bears mind saying that for people who physically are not able to keep the fast in the strict way, this isn't a matter of sin. This isn't like I had a piece of cheese on a no cheese day and I'm going to hell. There's none of that. Um, now, so what the what the church does ask for what Christ does ask us to do is to do the most that we're able to do. So if someone through various ailments or their age or certain medical conditions or certain uh, seasons of life, for example, the very old and the very young are not required to fast. Pregnant and nursing mothers are not required to fast uh, and so forth. But. For those or those who can medically, they can only do so much. They're just asked to do what they can. So you say, well, I can, I'm able to give up meat, but my doctor says I shouldn't give up dairy and eggs. Well, okay, very good. Follow the advice of your doctor. Keep the fast as much as you're able to. Because that goes to the reason why fasting isn't a matter of sin. You see, this is something that is, this is a voluntary exercise that we're taking on. That is meant to build, that is meant to habituate it to us. What St. Paul calls one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, engratia, or self mastery. And St. Paul also mentions in his epistles that some people have their God in their belly. Their belly leads them around. Well, it's the very first place and very easiest place to start practicing self control, to start practicing, practicing self mastery over our appetites. And then once we've gain the habit of doing it there, it's very easy to transfer that over to other things. So whether we fast or not is not a sin. But the reason why we fast or not can be a sin. If we're, fa if we're not fasting because we're resentful and bitter and angry and think that we know better than the awful church, well, that attitude, that's sinful. Fasting can also be sinful, the fathers tell us. If we're fasting and we're prideful and we're putting ourselves up as better than others, is thinking that we're superior because we've got a better practice, then we have ruined that fasting. And it's sinful. And St. John Chrysostom says, if you're going to devour your neighbor through gossip, just go ahead and eat the meat. You're wasting your time. 
So as I said, what then is the true nature of fasting? Well, the true nature of fasting consists in not getting your way. It's consists in putting your own agenda and your own will and your own way aside. Consider that you can have olives, but not olive oil. You can have grapes, but not wine. You can have octopus and squid, but not regular fish, except on days where the calendar says fish, and depending on the fast, there may be more or less of those. Does it make any sense? No, it shouldn't. It's not supposed to make sense. Orthodox fasting is meant to not be able to be done your way. It's meant to be inconvenient and no one's real choice plan of eating, no matter who you are. Whether you're a fish lover, a meat lover, you love cheese, you hate cheese, you like big meals, you like small meals, you should come to the fasting period and not be able to do it the way you want to do it. It is a practice in humility in getting out of our own heads, setting our own self aside. And not only setting our own self aside, our own appetites aside, and not only that, but then to take the finances that are saved and give that to those who are less fortunate, those who would kill to be able to eat this plate of rice and beans that we barely pay attention to. Orthodox fasting is a half year exercise in not doing it my way. We don't get to pick when we do it. We don't get to pick how we do it. Because we all need a little reminder that sometimes we need to get out of our own head. We need to get out of our own will. And we all need practice setting ourselves aside just a little bit, all the time. And once we're used to setting ourselves aside, it's very easy to turn to our neighbor, to turn to our brother, and treat them as Christ would treat them. In the Gospels, Christ says, When you fast, do not make your faces glum and sad like the hypocrites do so that their fasting will be known. But let your fa do your fasting in secret, wash your face, clean up, and let your fasting be only known to God, to God Almighty. But he didn't say if you fast. He didn't say if you'd like to fast. He said when you fast. So fasting is an optional, not according to Jesus. But we should still remember that principle. We shouldn't announce it with a big trumpet. We shouldn't have to say to everybody, no meat for me, I'm fasting. Just quietly order your rice and beans. Quietly order your veggie enchilada. No one needs to know. It's an exercise in not practicing our pride and hubris. In, a, in ancient mythology, hubris was the number one thing that would take down every last one of the great heroes. Hubris is an excessive pride. Very often when it comes to fasting, our hubris takes the form of saying, I know better. I know how I really need to do this. Don't worry, God will understand if I do it my way. Why? My way is so important. It's hubris. It's pride. It's a surety that I know best. The very thing that fasting is meant to set aside. And so, my brothers and sisters, we come to the very last point of that, and that is namely this. Year in and year out to go half a year, you get used to fasting pretty quick. It can start to become rote and become easy. And that's when it becomes ever more necessary to practice the real essential things that go with it. For Christ says, you tithe mint and dill and cumin, but you've neglected the way to your law, matters of the law, mercy and justice and truth. You should have done one without neglecting the other. It is good to practice the discipline, the self-mastery, and to abstain as the rest of the body of Christ is abstaining on the prescribed days. But we should not neglect charity, asking for forgiveness, taking responsibility for ourselves, helping the poor, helping those around us who need a hand, simple kind words to those whom everyone else overlooks. In short, every manner of good and charitable self-sacrificial act 
that fasting should remind us to set as a top priority. And if we ever so ramp that up constantly, our prayer and fasting periods can never get rote and never get robotic. But whether or not we put that heart into it lies with how we respond to the Spirit of God within us who calls us to fast and prayer. For behold, this kind comes out only through prayer and fasting. He stands at the door and knocks. And to the one who opens, he will enter in and die. May the Holy Trinity bless and protect you always. May he grant strength to your fasts and your prayers and your families.